Back in October, I attended the record fair here in Burlington, Vermont, and as you can imagine, I'm going to talk about the event as well as show off and chat about all of the records I got. Always a good time, so you should definitely stick around. So this was the 8th Burlington Record Fair, and as always, it took place at Nectar's here in Burlington, Vermont. Nectar's is otherwise a restaurant and music venue and has been since 1975. They don't get a lot of metal shows, unfortunately, though they totally surprised us all when Obituary played back in March of 2022, along with 200 Stab Wounds and Gruesome. So yeah, Nectar's, usually not where you expect metal. And I guess the fair is similar in that way. I mean, there's a lot of waiting for the bulk of other genres just to find some great metal. Speaking of finding, I didn't have to bring my glasses this time because I got contact lenses finally last month. And I really do need to stress the point of having decent vision at these events because there are a lot of reissues masquerading as OG copies going around, not to mention records in poor condition. Which is probably the perfect time for me to mention some of the records I passed on at the event. I did spot a copy of Restless and Wild by Accept, specifically the Burning Guitars cover, which isn't exactly common to find in America, but it was in shit shape, so I had to pass on it. Also, someone was selling a copy of Among the Living by Anthrax, definitely OG, but $160, I had to walk away from it. I almost thought I was about to buy a copy of the Hammer Smashed Face EP from Cannibal Corpse, until I saw that modern Metal Blade logo on the back and I knew it was a repress. And although I didn't need it, there was a copy of Bonded by Blood from Exodus, tagged at about $150. Hopefully, someone grabbed that one. But perhaps the granddaddy of high-priced metal records of the event was one vendor's copy of Rust in Peace by Megadeth. He stickered it at about $250, which is a standard Discogs rate for it, but he was really trying to hard sell it to me. I mean, really hard sell it. But I knew I'd find more great records for that amount of money than buying a single, albeit grill level album, so I went the frugal route. Kinda. And speaking of vendors, there were fewer of them this year than the last event I attended two years ago, which isn't exactly preferable. The number dropped from 16 to around 13 this time, but there were some really good ones. At this point, I should probably mention John Slade from Region 1 Records, who I think is from New Bedford, Massachusetts. Someone can correct me if I'm wrong on that one. He had the lion's share of amazing metal records at the event. I think I bought about five or six off of him, and I'll mention him again when one of those pops up later. And if you're now wondering about the total, I did pick up 12 records, so four more than any other record fair haul of mine. We've got seven metal records, two hard rock, one new wave, and a couple that fit into both the punk and metal genres, but some might consider them merely punk. At least three of these records fill the remaining hole in my preferred run of albums for their given bands. Two of these records have uncommon or even uncensored cover variants. And we'll have a number of gold stamp promos here as well. And I gotta say, I'm really excited about the compilation album I got, which we're gonna chat about at the end of the list, since I'm definitely saving that one for last. So yeah, let's get to the records. First up is the second studio album from British new wave artist Gary Newman and Tubeway Army. This is Replicas, released in 1979 by Atco Records. Also, a gold stamp promo here in the upper left-hand corner, as you can see, as well as a playlist sticker. Uh, the label usually tossed these on the fronts of their promo records back then to help DJs pick tracks by lengths and all that, so this is likely a radio station copy. Anyways, although still under the Tubeway Army moniker, this really is a Gary Newman solo album in a lot of ways, as it's the first in which he'd Doubled down on the electronic music, having shed the additional punk influence from the first record. On that note, Replicas is considered the first of Newman's machine phase, in which the lyrics are centered around dystopian science fiction, and that continues on the next two records, The Pleasure Principle and Telecon. The album managed two singles, both Down in the Park as well as Our Friends Electric. Regarding Down in the Park, it's been covered by Christian Death, Marilyn Manson, and believe it or not, the Foo Fighters, who actually do a really respectable version of it. Just check it out on YouTube sometime. My favorites on the record are definitely Me, I Disconnect From You, and Down in the Park. It's a track list to hear for you. 
Anyway, so this isn't metal. I mean, I get it, but I am a big fan of Newman's early work, and this definitely fills a long, empty hole in a run of albums I really love from this guy. Probably my favorite Gary Newman album, Neck and Neck with the Pleasure Principle, which was my first Gary Newman album when I discovered him back in 1981. And just get a look at a couple things here. We got the vinyl. Got those Atco labels there. There you are. Also has the original inner sleeve with full lyrics. So the shot of Gary and some credits on the reverse. So yeah, replicas. Gary Newman. Next is a third studio album from German metal band Except. This is Breaker, released in 1981 by Passport Records, which makes this a U.S. pressing. So this is Accept's attempt to get away from the forced commercialization of their last album, and it certainly makes strides in embracing heavy metal a lot more than on I'm a Rebel. You especially get a lot of what's to come from this band on the title track, but on others for sure. Of course, that's once you get past the opening song, Midnight Highway, which really doesn't fit on this record at all with its whole pop rock vibe. Even guitarist Wolf Hoffman didn't dig the song. The ballad breaking up again is decent, but it might have been more at home on, for example, a Scorpions album. But you do get to hear bassist Peter Baltus on lead vocals in case that's of any interest. Again, the track is fine, but I might have put it deeper down the track order or omitted it in favor of the more affected B-side ballad, Can't Stand the Night. Speaking of tracks, favorites here are Breaker, Starlight, and Feelings. Unfortunately, the version of Son of a Bitch on here is the censored one with the line Born to be Whipped replacing the title track in the chorus, not to mention tamer lyrics overall. Now, am I going to have to chase after the uncensored record? Probably at some point. Anyways, this definitely completes a run of albums from Except that I prefer, starting with this album and ending with Russian Roulette. I think Except is still finding their footing on this record, with some minor detours away from their more established metal sound later. But again, they are well on their way enough to merit getting this record. Of course, there it is on Passport Records. There you are. And there you go. Except. Next up is the second studio album from American progressive metal band Queensryche. This is Rage for Order, released in 1986 by EMI Records. This is also a gold stamp promo copy, as shown in the top right corner here. Anyways, some of you might be asking yourself, but wait, Matt, you already own this album, because we've definitely seen it on your channel before. Well, the copy from before, this one, has a black border behind the text, we'll put it there instead, and is the wide release that followed this cover, which has the sky blue pattern behind the text, Story goes that the Sky Blue variant was among a few thousand initial copies, but was replaced and continued with the black version, so the text could be more readable. So given that the Sky Blue version was in limited release, it's basically a collector's item, and that's why I snagged it. Truthfully, the seller really didn't know what he had, and of course, once the sale was final, I made sure to tell him exactly what he just sold me. Yeah, I'm like that sometimes. So this is definitely the band moving in a more progressive and even a little more experimental direction than the more power metal-centric sound on the previous two releases. And it wasn't until a few years ago that I actually discovered that the track Gonna Get Close To You is a cover song, originally done by the band Dal Bello, whoever they are. And it was the lead single off this record, so they basically pulled a quiet riot there. The record also incorporates synthesizers, as you might expect from some of the heavier bands in the mid-1980s. See Judas Priest for an excellent example of that, I guess. Anyways, this is the first prominent appearance of the band's tri reich logo here in the center of the cover, with variants used many times on their covers moving forward. Favorites on this one are I Dream in Infrared, Gonna Get Close to You, and Screaming in Digital. So this is my favorite Queensryche album, though mostly not other people's favorite, with the popular vote often going to the album before this or the album after this. And I get it, but I do love this album dearly and glad to have this cover variant in my collection. And there's the EMI labels there for you. There you go. And it did come with the original uh, inner sleeve here. Lyrics and all that. 
a great image they had on this album, which they quickly got rid of after the next album. There you go. And we use Queensryche, Rage for Order. Next is the second studio album from American punk metal band, The Plasmatics. This is Beyond the Valley of 1984, released in 1981 by Stiff Records. So a lot of metal fans know Wendy O. Williams from her solo career, but before that, she was the front woman for this amazing band that appealed to both punk and metal fans. And that would be more the case on the next release for that metal appeal factor. And we'll be talking about that record as well in a little bit. Though it might be fair to say that you can also catch some hints of Motorhead at times on this record, but maybe throw in a little Ramones as well, and some definite moments of more mainstream metal of the time, notably in the solo work. But the star of this show really is Wendy O, who provided a mix of vocal approaches, ranging from sexy to aggressive to downright spooky. Check the album intro track Incantation for that last one. There's also a couple live tracks peppered in here, both Hitman and Plasma Jam, which definitely show the punky and more energetic side of this band. Speaking of tracks, my favorites are Master Plan, Nothing, and A Pig is a Pig. So another band I always feel fits in well with the Plasmatics around this time is 45 Grave, and I think fans of that band will dig this album as well. Overall, a decent record, the lean's a bit more punk than future releases from the band. I should show that also comes with a gatefold. Great shots there. Also, the record on the original Stiff Records label there for you. There you go. And I'm not sure if that's it. That is it. There you go. Plasmatics. Next up is the second EP from, again, American punk metal band The Plasmatics. This is Metal Priestess, released in 1981 by Stiff Records. So I actually discovered the band when this EP came out, specifically in October of 1981 when the band appeared on the Canadian sketch comedy show that also aired in America called SCTV. That's when I got to witness the band's stage performance and got to hear Doom Song live, which is on this EP in studio form. Seriously, go find that SCTV clip on YouTube to hear and see what I mean. Strangely, I actually didn't buy this record or any other from them until a few years later, but that one performance definitely stayed with me as a kid. Anyways, this is where you're going to hear a lot more metal influence than previous efforts. Production has improved dramatically here, guitars are heavied up in a more metal sense, and you even get some occasional clean singing from Wendy O, specifically in the opening track, Lunacy. It's a good track, but I wouldn't have opened the record with it. Rather, track two, Doom Song, is the far superior track, both in and of itself, but also what I consider the better candidate for album opener in general. You even get some shred in there, which is pretty fun. And SCP also has a couple live tracks tossed in, both Sex Junkie and Master Plan, whose studio versions were on the record I just talked about. The good production even extends to the live tracks, which is super nice, and you can definitely hear the crowd pretty well on that one. Both of them, actually. It's possible that this version of Master Plan is actually better than the studio original. You should definitely check this one out first. Anyways, favorites are Doom Song and Black Leather Monster, but especially Doom Song, which is likely my very favorite Plasmatic song. So of the two Plasmatic records I got, I'm definitely recommending this one the most, especially if you're a metal fan and if you've never heard the band before. This is definitely a sought-after EP for me and glad to find it in such great shape. But it's cool to have the punkier album for this, too. Also, rest in peace, Wendy O. We've got the record here. Stiff Records again. Great labels this time. And they did get the inner sleeve. Full lyrics. And credits and all that on the reverse. Metal Priestess. I miss Wendy O. Next is the fourth EP from British metal band Raven. This is Mad, released in 1986 by Atlantic Records. This is also a gold stamp promo copy shown right here at the top. Also the cutout there, which no one loves. So right away, even though it came out during their major label era, this is not the previous two albums in terms of that commercial sound. This is Raven more or less going back to their roots, Five tracks in total on this EP, starting with the up-tempo and manic track Speed of the Reflex, which is pure Raven insanity. 
Love it. And that classic Raven style continues through the EP. In fact, it's clear that these scant five songs utterly bury their previous full-length album, The Pack Is Back, and even surpass most of the material on the album before that, such being Stay Hard. Though to be fair, Side 1 is a little stronger than Side 2. Favorites include Do or Die and Give Me Just a Little. My only complaint, if it even is one, would be that I would have rather had this been a full-length album instead of an EP, given the stellar return to form that it clearly is. Such a great band, even now. I mean, if you haven't seen them live yet, you're doing yourself a huge disservice by missing out. There are the Atlantic labels for you. And the very plain but logoed Atlantic Inner Sleeve. There you go. Raven. Next up is the seventh international studio album from somewhat Australian hard rock band ACDC. This is For Those About to Rock, We Salute You, released in 1981 by Atlantic Records. This copy is a Columbia House version. So here we've got the follow-up to their highly successful Back in Black album. In fact, 27 times platinum for the latter. So following that up was probably a bit of a challenge for the band. In one sense, for those about to rock, it didn't do as well, certifying it four times platinum, but it did become their first number one album on the Billboard 200, so it didn't do that badly. Of course, this is the third and final ACDC album produced by Mutt Lang before the band decided to momentarily go off and produce their own records. But I gotta say, I'm a Mutt fan, and his mix on this is up to standard for him. Because of later releases, I'm not sure it was really smart to ditch the guy, but I'm not in the band, so doesn't really matter. His favorites of this one are For Those About to Rock, We Salute You, Let's Get It Up, and Spellbound. So this too fills the last hole in the run of ACDC albums I like. I've been planning to get this for I don't know how many years, but when I saw it at the fair, I just decided to pull the trigger. I mean... It is a common record. In fact, most internationally re released ACDC records of the 1970s and 1980s are super easy to find, at least in the United States, though. I'd imagine likewise in other places. Anyways, finding this wasn't luck or anything like that. It was just a matter of actually buying it. And now I've got it, which is pretty cool. Uh, I just come with the gatefold. Shout out the band live. Very, very cool. And the vinyl... Atlantic labels, uh, usually the same labels in the early 80s for them like this, except they're, the colors usually match the record. Back in Blacks was black. This one's this more, uh, I don't know, bronze or whatever color you can make it out to be. There it is. ACDC, for those about to rock, we salute you. Next is the second studio album from American heavy metal band Lizzie Borden. This is Menace to Society, released in 1986 by Enigma Records. So this was the first Lizzie Borden album to actually chart, specifically number 144 on the U.S. Billboard 200 chart. It was also produced by Jim Ferracci, who handled some rather big albums for bands like Poison and L.A. Guns, though. Unlike those two bands, Lizzie seemed to have a bit more punch to them and certainly fit the label Heavy Metal a lot better than their hair band contemporaries. Maybe having more in common with scene mates like Armored Saint and Keel, but also bands outside of California, such as early Queensryche, as well as Malice. Great band. Should have gotten a lot more recognition than they actually did. Favorites on this one include Notorious, Ultraviolence, and Menace to Society. Also came with the original merch form, which I wish I had back when I did my merch forms video which you should watch, by the way, after watching this. Very cool to have. Ah, look at that. There you go. Again, you should see it twice. There you go. Fantastic. Also, the uh, inner sleeve here with lyrics and a rather interesting drawing of the band. There you go. And the vinyl, of course. Enigma Records there. And there. So it would actually been a while since I sat down and actually listened to a Lizzie Borden record. And while spitting this one, I realized just how underrated this band is. It's totally killer, riffs for days, great solo work, tracks that truly stand out one from the other and in all the best ways, not to mention those stellar and somewhat unique vo vocals. 
of their namesake singer. Slowly to get their debut EP, Give Them the Axe, as well as their 1989 album, Master of Disguise, and that'll have all of their releases from the classic era, which is more or less all I really need from them. Next up is the 21st single from British heavy metal band Judas Priest. This is Hot Rockin', the 12-inch version, released in 1981 by CBS Records, which makes this a UK pressing. This is also a white label promo, as the disc label shows. White label promo discs are specifically pressed for, as you would imagine, promotional reasons, typically for radio stations. So in addition to the title track, the B-side has two live songs, both Breaking the Law and Living After Midnight, songs they perform in concert to this very day. They recorded in February of 1981, and as Halford states in the track, Amsterdam. Given that, Setlist.fm puts the show at February 14th with Saxon as the opening act, just in case you needed the extra metal nerd details there. Recording is better than good, but not perfect. Doesn't matter, though. Great live versions of classic tracks. So this was a UK single I'd likely never see again here in the States, so I had to get it. Plus, and this might not be a popular setup, but I actually like Hot Rockin' and the album it comes from. So that's all the justification I need. And I'll just pull the record out. You've seen Black before, but a slightly better look at it there. And track listing there. Hot Rockin'. Next is the debut studio album from Belgian heavy metal band Ostrogoth. This is Ecstasy and Danger, released in 1984 by Mausoleum Records. So finding an Ostrogoth album at the record fair was a bit of a shock. In fact, records from any of those older Belgian metal bands like Crossfire and Killer are always on my want list whenever I go out buy records. So I was, again, pleasantly shocked to not only find this one, but have it in such great shape as well. Anyways, I always dug how these Belgian bands didn't quite follow the rules, which gave them a more unique sound. Though to be fair, you can hear touches of outside influence. In this band's case, some Scorpions is definitely in the mix, but maybe also some Accept, and some early Iron Maiden in those more power metal moments. A good case for the no rules thing for them is found in the opening track, Queen of Desire. It is an eight-minute epic that delivers a number of musical moods, but largely remains a little dark. And since English is not their native tongue, you can expect some interesting lyrics throughout the record. The song The New Generation really comes to mind. Anyways, favorites on this one are Ecstasy and Danger, Stormbringer, and Scream Out. So a very consistent banger of a record with all of the spirit and up-tempo drive so well represented in the best of independent metal bands of the time. It's sad that Belgium got so overlooked by so many metal fans back then. Including me, by the way. Now, maybe it was a distro problem. Who knows? But what I do know is that I would have been just as excited to hear this record in 1984 as I was when I first heard Hellion or Tokyo Blade or Omen or any of those bands. So yeah, better late than never. Take a look at the vinyl here. It's great Mausoleum Records labels. I think Witchfind was on Mausoleum. I can't remember who else was, but yeah, great to see it. Anyways, Ostrogoth. Awesome find. Next is a third studio album from German hard rock band The Scorpions. This is In Trance, released in 1975 by RCA International Records. So I should mention that this is a 1983 repress from RCA in Germany, but what ties this to the original is this uncensored cover. For those not familiar, if you look very closely, there's a nipple. <laughs> it's airbrushed out for other countries, notably in the United States, but not on the German pressing. And since I never had this album on the vinyl format at any time, kind of lucked out by finding this edition first. So one thing you notice right away is that guitarist Uli John Roth is singing more songs on this record than their actual singer is. Six tracks for Roth and only four for Klaus, so that's different. Also, no Matthias Jobs or Herman Rarebell yet, but Roth on guitar is always worth the listen because, let's be honest, he is the guitar god on this record. Check out Evening Wind for some incredibly soulful playing from Roth. Anyway's favorite tracks here are In Trance, Top of the Bill, and Robot Man. So as far as the run of albums I most prefer from this band, I'm now only missing Taken by Force on vinyl. Though I might also get those first two records last if I'm feeling it, but I might not either, who knows. I generally end with Love at First Sting, though I really dug their Rock Believer album from 2022 as well, and I do have that one. So yeah, 
I got the nipple album. Well, okay, there's that other Scorpions album with nipples right after this one, but let's not talk about that one. Show you the vinyl really quick. There you go. RCA labels on both sides. There you go. Scorpions in trance. Next is a compilation album of metal bands from around the world. This is Bonsai Axe, released in 1985 by Bonsai Records. So Bonsai was a Canadian label that mainly licensed metal albums from outside Canada, with some distro help from Polygram, and was the way a lot of Canadian teenagers of the 1980s discovered bands like Metallica, Venom, Slayer, Creator, and many others. Also, Bonsai is the label that gave us the Speed Metal Swirl logo that is now representative of that entire subgenre of metal. It's pretty cool. They didn't release very many compilation albums in their lifetime, but this is certainly a well-known one, and this one's been on my want list for quite a while. I mean, check out the bands here on both the front and the back cover. Very cool. In addition to some of the bigger names here, it's really nice to also see bands like Tokyo Blade, Overdrive, and Sortilage, among quite a few others. Just want to show you the vinyl at this point. Uh, the first record is the regular record, I guess. That'll make more sense when I show the other one. Bonsai labels, very cool. There are a couple of variants of this label, but I really like this one the best. The second record is uh, considered an EP. It has three tracks on it, one each from Avenger, Omen, and Maniacs, because why not three more songs on its own record? Bonsai. Anyways, favorites on this one are Hung, Drawn, and Quarter by Raven, Heavy Metal Breakdown by Gravedigger, and Lightning Strikes by Tokyo Blade. I should also show you the inner sleeve on here. It's actually pretty cool. Uh, it has the albums that these tracks are from. Definitely have some of these in my collection for sure. Got the Raven, the Metallica, the Venom, Slayer, the Gravedigger. Uh, I used to have trouble as a kid. This album, I gotta get it again. I don't have the Warfare album. I have the Overdrive, I have the Tokyo Blade... Uh, and I'm missing these guys down here, especially Battle Cry from Omen. I really need to get that record one day, just break down and spend the money to get it because it's really an amazing record. You know, the funny thing here was that John from the Region 1 Records booth told me he almost saved this record for himself instead of selling it to someone else. I told him I was glad he didn't because now it's mine. Uh, John's a good dude with a decent knowledge of metal, and again, so many great records. I mean, I could have easily spent another couple hundred dollars at the booth. So anyways, this comp is a solid mix of both established acts and lesser-known bands at the time. Of course, you know, I love comps like this. I've said that over and over again on the channel. These types of records were the chief means of band discovery for me as a teenager. I wish I had found this one way back then. But yeah, great comp and a great find at the Burlington Record Fair. So I'd like to thank Evan over at Burlington Records for once again hosting this event. If you're in the New England area in October, you should definitely check it out. And if you own a record store or a distro that sells records at these kind of events, maybe get a hold of Evan through the Burlington Records Instagram or Facebook accounts and maybe set something up. We could always use more vendors at the Burlington Record Fair and make it so much cooler. Of course, some of you might already be familiar with record fairs or record expos or whatever yearly event you attend for used metal records. You should let me know in the comments about the ones you go to, how you feel about them, and any cool finds you got. Always dig hearing about how other organizers set up and run these types of things, but I also want to hear about what you got, so definitely let me know in the comments below. And if this is your first time here, just so you know, my name is Matt. This is the Accusation Network, where each and every week I do videos on metal vinyl collecting, but also modern and classic metal in general. If you like that, definitely subscribe to my channel if you haven't already done so. I may also give this video a like and share out my other videos, maybe even this one, with some of your friends on social media. And as always, thank you for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.